So this morning, we're happy to have Edward Witten um, with his fourth lecture on quantization gauge theory and the analytic approach to geometric line lengths. Uh, thank you. So today I'll be discussing the work of Eddinghoff, Frankel, and Kajdan that I mentioned Friday. And there had been earlier developments by Teschner, which probably will also be covered in Teschner's lectures. My lecture is based on this recent paper with Davide Cayoto. So Eddinghoff, Frankel, and Kajdan considered the Hilbert space curly H of L2 functions on the moduli space of stable homomorphic G bundles over C. Actually, as we discussed in the lecture on the Arsene Klein and Sashadri, it might be better to say semi-stable to get a compact moduli space. And it's also a bit more accurate, to, well, more canonical to speak of half densities rather than functions because it's half densities that naturally make a Hilbert space. Actually, this moduli space has a natural Kähler structure. So it has a natural density. So there's no real difference between functions and half densities. But in general here, it would be more natural to speak of half densities. So they constructed operators on this Hilbert space that are related to the usual constructions of geometric line lengths and found interesting duality theorems and conjectures about these operators. So as we discuss the physical setup, we'll see what the statements might be. So in geometric quantization, one would understand L2 functions on some space in terms of quantizing the cotangent bundle of that space. So here the cotangent bundle of the moduli space of bundles is a dense open set in the Higgs bundle moduli space. And in an L2 theory, removing a set of measure zero isn't important. So the Hilbert space of EFK is what you get if you take the Higgs bundle moduli space with its real symplectic structure, this should be real omega, I'm not sure why I wrote M omega, and quantize it by geometric quantization, treating it as a cotangent bundle. So the Hilbert space that we're going to discuss isn't mysterious. It's just the natural quantization of a cotangent bundle. But if we just call it the natural quantization of a cotangent bundle, we won't understand what to do with Ecke operators. If we are going to get anywhere in terms of predictions from duality, we need to understand this quantization in terms of brains. And that's why I told you about brain quantization. So as we know, the first step is to pick a complexification of the Higgs bundle moduli space that should have some nice properties. Here, we'll just use the following fact. Any complex manifold Y viewed as a real manifold has a canonical complexification, namely what I'll call Y hat, the product of two copies of Y with opposite complex structures I and minus I. So because um, the complex structures on the two factors are opposite, the involution of Y hat that exchanges the two factors is anti-holomorphic. It reverses the complex structure of the product. Its fixed point set is the diagonal y inside y1 times y2. So we're in the situation we want, where the manifold we want to quantize, in this case y, has a complexification, namely y1 times y2, and it has an involution tau that's anti-holomorphic, and y is a component of the fixed point set, in this case, the whole fixed point set. Since the complex structures on the two factors are opposite, we can take the holomorphic symplectic form of y hat to be what I call half omega direct sum rather than direct product with half omega bar. In other words, half omega on y1 and half omega bar on y2. If we do this, we see that the restriction of omega hat to the diagonal is real omega. In other words, the diagonal y is Lagrangian for m omega and symplectic for real omega, which as we discussed is the right setup for brain quantization. So that's the situation in which quantization of Y using a Lagrangian brain B supported on Y makes sense. Moreover, the real polarization that, of the cotangent bundle that leads to the Hilbert space studied by these authors does analytically continue to a holomorphic polarization of Y hat. So that's the situation in which brain quantization will agree with geometric quantization. 
So the purpose of last sentence was to explain why the Hilbert space studied by EFK is the one that arises in brain quantization. However, we have to ask what are the observables in brain quantization? Let's recall Hitchens' integrable system. So the Higgs bundle moduli space has a Hitchin vibration, which I'll call pi, a projection from the Higgs bundle moduli space to B, which is Cn for some n. The linear functions on B are Hitchin's commuting Hamiltonians. Classically, the global homomorphic functions on the Higgs bundle moduli space are just the pullbacks of functions on B. In other words, the algebra A0 of holomorphic functions on the Higgs bundle moduli space is the algebra of polynomials in the Hitchin Hamiltonians. What are the quantum observables in brain quantization? Well, first of all, we need a, a, to define a canonical quasitropic brain of the complexification, which in this case is the product y1 times y2. We can just use a product of quasitropic brains on the two factors y1 and y2. So the algebra on y1, or the, the brain on y1 we discussed Friday, the corresponding algebra, is a quantum deformed version of the ring of holomorphic functions. And for y2, we've just picked the anti the uh, complex conjugate brain with the opposite complex structure. So it will be similarly related to anti holomorphic functions. So the algebra that will act by quantizing holomorphic functions on y will just be a tensor a bar, where a and a bar are quantum deformed versions of the rings of Hitchens holomorphic and anti-holomorphic Hamiltonians. In the particular case of the Higgs bundle moduli space, you can show that the quantum deformed rings are still commutative. That's due to Hitchin for SL2 and to Balenson and Drinfeld in general. The quantum deformed objects are the commuting differential operators that are the quantization of Hitchin's classical commuting Hamiltonians. So the four dimensional gauge theory gives another explanation of the fact that the quantum deformed ring is still commutative. It's similar to the explanation I gave of the fact that Hecke functors at distinct points P and P prime commute. So in A, I've acted with a holomorphic Hitchin Hamiltonian and an anti-holomorphic one. One is inserted on the left, one is inserted on the right. So it's obvious that you can move one up or down relative to the other with no singularity and therefore that the two commute. In B, I've inserted two commuting Hamiltonians. They're inserted in a definite order along the boundary. So in a two-dimensional picture, it looks like they might not commute. But there are two hidden dimensions, and <clears throat> we can assume that these two operators are supported at distinct points in C, which means they can move past each other in the picture, but they miss, they're different, they have disjoint support in C. So again, there's no singularity and the two operators commute. So we want to understand the action of the commuting and anti-commuting Hamiltonians on the Hilbert space, which in this case is the L2 functions or half densities on the ordinary moduli space. First of all, there's no mystery about the fact that this algebra does act. That's just the statement that holomorphic and anti-holomorphic differential operators can act on functions, more accurately half densities, on the moduli space. Holomorphic functions operators, holomorphic operators trivially commute with anti-holomorphic ones. And in this case, the algebras of holomorphic or anti-holomorphic differential operators are separately commutative. But what are the joint eigenvalues of Hitchens Hamiltonians and their complex conjugates? To answer this question, we apply duality. So we want to apply duality to the Hilbert space, which is defined in brain quantization as HOM from a Lagrangian brain to the canonical quasitropic brain, where that one here is a product of brains on the two factors. So naively, we need to understand the duals of the three brains involved, the two quasitropic brains and also the diagonal brain. So BCC1 is the brain associated to deformation quantization of the ring of holomorphic functions. 
And as I explained before, its dual is the structure sheaf of the variety of ochres. The, uh, um, a Lagrangian brain supported a Lagrangian submanifold that I call L pair in MH in Higgs bundle moduli space of the dual group. So that's deduced from the fact that this brain is a D3 NS5 bound recognition. And its dual is therefore a D3, D5 bound recognition, which in algebra geometric language, language is this. So an OPER is a flat bundle whose holomorphic structure obeys a certain condition that I'll explain in a few minutes. Likewise, BCC2 is the brain associated to deformation quantization of the ring of anti-holomorphic functions. So its dual is the structure sheaf of L -A pair bar, the Lagrangian submanifold that parameterizes flat bundles whose anti-holomorphic structure is an OPER. By the way, you might be a little surprised that either a holomorphic OPER or an anti-holomorphic OPER is a holomorphic condition. The point is that in the complex structure that parameterizes flat bundles, the complex structure of C is irrelevant and the holomorphic or anti-holomorphic conditions in that complex structure are completely symmetrical from the point of view of the complex structure in which the, this is, in which the Higgs bundle moduli space parameterizes flat complex bundles. <clears throat> now, what about the brain B supported on the diagonal? Well, there's an unfolding trick that shows we don't have to worry about it. So we have a theory which is based on two copies of Y, two copies of Higgs bundle moduli space. So you can think of it as a two-sheeted world where one sheet is mapped to Y1 and one sheet is mapped to Y2. And the left boundary conditions don't couple Y1 and Y2, so the two sheets are separate. But the right boundary, we have this Lagrangian brain supported on the diagonal and it's Champaton bundle is trivial, so there's nothing except a condition that the fields agree that the two maps to Y1 and Y2 coincide on the boundary. So if you unfold it, we just have a strip of twice the width with a single map to Y, and nothing is happening where the boundary, the second brain used to be. So I've drawn a vertical line where this fold used to be, but nothing is happening there. So in this picture, there's just a single copy of the Higgs bundle moduli space. We have the standard A model of a single copy. We've got one quasitropic brain on the left and a conjugate quasitropic brain on the right. I see a slight mismatch between my notation in the text and in the picture. So what in the picture are BCC1 and BCC2 are here called BCC and BCC tilde, where BCC tilde is a conjugate version of BCC adapted to the opposite complex structure on the Higgs bundle moduli space. So to dualize this picture, we don't have to say anything about the middle where nothing's happening. We just dualize the two brains on the boundaries. And that gives us the O pair and anti O pair boundary conditions, which are the varieties in the Higgs bundle moduli space of the dual group that parameterizes flat bundles with complex complexification of the dual group as its structure group, whose holomorphic and anti-holomorphic structures respectively are OPERs. So the algebra A becomes home from L O pair to itself. And the algebra, a, these are, so A, the hit, quantum Hitchin Hamiltonians, holomorphic ones become this, and the anti-holomorphic Hitchin Hamiltonians become this. So one is the algebra of holomorphic functions on L O pair, and the other one, L O pair bar. So here are the two dual pictures for describing the Hilbert space. In one picture, the Hilbert space is obtained by quantizing the A model on the strip with a quasitropic brain and its conjugate at the two ends. In the other picture, we have a B model on the same strip with Lagrangian brains on the two sides. So then the spectrum of A tensor A bar well, the spectrum here abstractly, the Hilbert space, the act one, is hum from one to the other, but in the B model, it's hum between two Lagrangian brains. But in the B model, well, in the B, the B model is straightforward to calculate because it localizes on constant maps. 
And in particular, if you have two Lagrangian submanifolds whose intersections are isolated points, transverse intersections at isolated points, which happens here, then the Hamm space is very simple. It just has a basis with one state for each intersection point. So the B model gives an answer. Well, as you'll see, it gives an answer in a very concrete way for the spectrum of the commuting Hamiltonians. The eigenvectors just correspond to the intersection points of these two grains. So what are the int intersection points? Well, now I have to tell you what an O-pair or an anti-O-pair is. An O-pair, for simplicity, I'll consider the case that the dual group is SL2. A flat bundle E is an O-pair holomorphically, if holomorphically it's a non-trivial extension. A non-trivial extension of that kind is unique up to isomorphism. So this uniquely characterizes the holomorphic structure of E. Any condition that fixes the holomorphic structure of E determines a Lagrangian submanifold where you vary the anti-holomorphic structure. E is an OPER anti-holomorphically, if anti-holomorphically, it's a non-trivial extension. So K is the K is the holomorphic canonical bundle and K to the half is its square root. K bar is the anti-holomorphic can canonical bundle, but it's the same as the complex conjugate of K. And K bar to the one half is an anti-holomorphic square root. So both of these conditions are holomorphic in complex structure J, in which the Higgs bundle moduli space parameterizes flat bundles with complex structure group. So these conditions on E sound rather mysterious when stated without any explanation. Bayon and Drinfeld found them by studying the current algebra of G. At the critical level, K equals minus H, where it develops a large center. They showed that the center corresponds to the um, quantum Hitchin Hamiltonians. They use this to prove that the Hitchin Hamiltonians can be quantized to commutative differential operators. And then they use this setup of current algebra to show that the, well, the spectrum in a somewhat abstract sense corresponds to the, I say abstract sense because they didn't have a Hilbert space. Car, spectrum in the sense of the, um, well, here they had a commutative algebra and spectrum just meant it's one dimensional representations. The spectrum in that abstract sense corresponded to holomorphic operas. Gaiato and I just recovered these fact conditions from studying the D3D5 system. As I remarked on Friday, the, the canonical quasitropic brain descends from a slightly deformed D3 NS5 boundary condition. So its dual comes from a D3D5 system. The D3D5 system has been studied a lot in, by string theorists. It has remarkable properties. For example, it forms a fun, fuzzy funnel as first shown by Myers, I think, in the Myers effect. The fuzzy funnel is related to Nam's equations and the singular boundary condition used by Nam in studying magnetic monopoles in supersymmetric gauge theories. So anyway, by studying the D3D5 system, we'd recovered, well, explained the role of Oprah, let's say, and recovered results of Balenton and Drinfeld. So <clears throat> I guess that was mainly done in this paper. So <clears throat> I explained when we discussed brain quantization that using a anti-holomorphic involution tau, this hum space carries your Hermitian inner product which we expect to be positive as it corresponds to quantization of a cotension bundle. So the dual space likewise carries a non-degenerate inner product, which is defined in a similar way using an anti-holomorphic involution of the dual moduli space. This non-degenerate inner product can be defined for any B brains that are exchanged by tau dual, such as LO pair and LO pair bar, but any other pair. For generic such B brains, it would not be positive definite. It's very hard to get something positive definite out of the B model. And <clears throat> one can show, well, okay. one can show that very strong conditions that match conjectures of EF and K have to be true in order to get a positive definite inner product in the B model. I'll explain a little bit of that. Consider a point X, which is an intersection point of LO pair and LO pair bar. 
that corresponds to a flat bundle E that's an O pair both holomorphically and anti-holomorphically. The anti-holomorphic involution tau dual that is used to define the Hermitian structure on the G dual side will map E to the complex conjugate flat bundle E bar, which is also an O pair both holomorphically and anti-holomorphically. The anti-holomorphic structure of one is the holomorphic structure of the other and vice versa. If E isn't homomorphic to E bar, then the way the Hermitian form is defined will show that they're both null vectors. And if you have a null vector, then of course the Hermitian form can't be positive definite. But the duality predicts that it should be positive definite. So we expect that as was conjectured by EFK and proved in some cases, E is always isomorphic to E bar. Thus the claim is that the flat GC bundles that are OPER is both holomorphically and anti-holomorphically are actually real. That is their structure group reduces to a real form of G. Assuming the intersection points are all real in that sense, you can show as a general statement about the B model that the hum space is positive definite only if all intersection points are always transverse. Uh, I, the proof was a little bit long, so I decided not to include it but I will tell you why I thought it was going to be true. Consider the B model for closed strings. If the target space is a point, then there's the physical Hilbert space is one dimensional and it has a positive inner product. Now suppose that the target space is a complex manifold of higher dimension, but suppose there's an anti-holomorphic map so we can define our emission structure. It's not going to be positive because B model inner products will pair a bottom degree differential form with the top degree differential form. Actually, instead of differential forms, there are zero Q forms with values in anti-symmetric tensor powers of the tangent bundle. But it's similar to pairings of wedge products of differential forms. And except in the middle dimension, there's no chance to get positivity. So the only way to get positivity is if the middle dimension is the only dimension which only happens if the total dimension is zero. So that's why I thought we would discover that the intersection points had to be isolated. And if you think more carefully, they have to be transverse in order to get positivity. And that's true. And the proof largely consists of writing out in detail what is the B model of quantum mechanics for open strings in this situation and showing it has all the properties similar to what I said for closed strings. So what I told you more or less is the way the proof goes, but it's a little bit long to write it out. So the statement about transversality is also among the results slash conjectures of EFK. Now, if a flat bundle E is an OPER both holomorphically and, and sorry, if a flat bundle E is an OPER holomorphically and is also real, meaning a structure group reduces to a real subgroup, then it's also an OPER anti-holomorphically. So these are what EFK called the real OPERs. So assuming the duality is true and the Hermitian form is positive definite, the joint spectrum of A and A bar correspond to real OPERs. Here, joint spectrum means simultaneous eigenvalues. So A and A bar are algebras of commuting differential operators. They commute with each other and they also are separately commutative. So we have a lot of commuting operators, Hitchens, quantized, commute holomorphic and anti-holomorphic Hamiltonians. They simultaneously commute, so they have joint eigenvalues and their joint eigenvectors are the states corresponding to the real operas. And there's a simple formula for the eigenvalues, which we can get by following Balanton and Drinfeld. So according to Balanton and Drinfeld, an element X of the algebra A has two interpretations. One, it's a holomorphic differential operator. I wrote bungee, which is their terminology in our lecture. It should be the moduli space of semi-stable bundles. That's the A model description. And the B model description is that it corresponds to a holomorphic function F sub X on L O pair. Similarly, an element X prime of A bar is an anti-holomorphic differential operator in the A model. And in the B model, it's a holomorphic function on the on L O pair bar. So an intersection point P of the L O pair and L O pair bar determines a pair of eigenvalues of the differential operators X and X prime 
namely fx of p and fx prime of p. And that's the proposal for the joint spectrum of Hitchens quantized Hamiltonians. EF and K also introduce Hecke operators as operators on the Hilbert space H that arise when we quantize the Higgs bundle moduli space as a real symplectic manifold. I already explained that line operators of the four dimensional gauge theory can be used to define functors on the category of brains or boundary conditions. And moreover, at Houghton, Wilson line operators or dual pairs of functors on the A and B model categories. The same line operators are operators on the quantum Hilbert space. So I've tried to explain this with the following picture. So A, I draw the old story, and a Tuft operator T is parallel to the boundary, and it gives a functor on the category of brains, meaning you could move it up to the boundary and replace the boundary B by new boundary T times V. In B, the same line operator running horizontally rather than vertically makes an operator T on the Hilbert space, where H in this case is hung from B prime to B for some brains B and B prime. So the idea in B is that a quantum state comes in at the bottom, T acts, and a possibly different quantum state goes out at the top. But in B, you have to ask what is happening at the endpoints where a line operator T ends on a boundary. The picture, so that question is raised in B and the purpose of C is to answer it. The point of C is to explain that the corner in this picture represents an element of HOM from B to TB. In other words, looking at the left boundary, we have B in the past and TB in the future. So T is acted to map the, in the old sense of line operators as functors on the category of brains. T is acted to convert the brain B into the brain TB. So the corner is an element of HOM from B to TB. And so actually to define the operator T on HOM from B prime to B, this should be in, in B, not in A, to define the operator that appears in this middle picture, you need junctions alpha in HOM from B to TB and similarly beta at this endpoint in HOM from TB prime to B prime. But if you're given this data, well, an Hooft line operator together with such alpha and beta will define a concrete operator on the Hilbert space that we get by brain quantization in this situation. The argument that showed commutativity of the functors on the category of brains goes over immediately to show that the concrete operators on Hilbert space likewise commute. <clears throat> we just say that because these operators live at different points in C, they can be moved up and down past each other without singularity. And we can even take a limit t, p goes to p prime and retain commutativity, even though the representations r and r prime might be different. Um, a similar argument shows that the Hecke operators commute with the quantized versions of Hitchens holomorphic or anti-holomorphic Hamiltonians. In two dimensions, it looks like there could be a problem in moving x past a Hecke operator, but in four dimensions, it's obvious there's no problem. <clears throat> Finally, we can ask what are the predictions of the duality for the eigenvalues of the Hecke operators? To answer this, we start on the g dual side. We're going to find the eigenvalues of Wilson operator acting on the Hilbert space, hauling from one to the other, Lagrangian brain, and then the duality will predict that the eigenvalues of the Hecke operator are the same. Also, we'll find what kind of data is needed for the corners that make W, the Wilson operator, into an operator. Again, the duality predicts that the same data is needed to define the Hecke operator. So given a bundle E for the dual group, the bundle with connection over sigma times C, remember C is the Riemann surface we're studying, and sigma is the auxiliary Riemann surface I actually draw in the pictures. And given a representation R of the dual group, we form the associated bundle that mathematicians describe this way, which also comes with a connection. Then the Wilson operator, WR of gamma, for a path gamma in the four manifold is defined by parallel transport of the connection on this bundle E sub R along gamma. So often one considers 
parallel transport around the closed loop and then you take the trace. But here we fix a point P and C and two points A and B on the right and left boundaries and a point, a path in sigma times P from A times B to B times P. For example, the simple horizontal path I've drawn. So this is the choice you make because that will correspond to the Wilson operators I was talking about. Then if ER A times P and ER B times P are the fibers of ER at A times P and B times B, then parallel transport defines for each connection a linear transformation from ER A times P to ER B times P or equivalently an element you can think of the Wilson operator as a parallel transport from that maps this vector space to this one. But to treat the two representations more symmetrically, I'd rather say that the Wilson operator maps this vector space times the dual of this one to C, complex numbers. So I introduced the dual representation R prime of R, and then I can more symmetrically say that the Wilson operator is a hom from a vector a fiber of a bundle here, ten, tensored with a fiber of a bundle here to complex numbers. A quantum operator is going to come from something that's a complex valued function of connections. So we don't have that yet. What we have is that for each connection, we have to find a map from a vector space to C. To get an operator, we should supply element V in this vector space and W in this vector space. And then the map WRP applied to V tensor W will be a function of connections whose quantization will be an operator. This will be an easy operator to diagonalize and evaluate as we'll see. To avoid unnecessary details, I'll state the following for the case that the dual group is SL2 and R is the two dimensional representation in which case R prime is the same. There's a straightforward generalization to any group and representation. So in this picture, the boundary condition on the right boundary is that the G-dual bundle E restricted to the right boundary is an anti-holomorphic oper. And that means by definition that there is a non-split exact sequence where K bar is the canonical bundle of C bar. C bar is C with the opposite complex structure. K bar to the one half is the square root of K bar. We pick here a square root, but the choice will cancel out in a moment. So if we pick a vector V in k bar of p to the one half, which is the fiber of k bar to the one half at p, then j bar of v is a vector in one of our two vector spaces. Similarly, on the left boundary, the boundary condition says that E is a holomorphic over, so there's a non-split exact sequence where this maps to zero on the right. So we pick w in the fiber of this space on the left, and that gives us j of w, in our other vector space. So in other words, the data we need to define the corners corresponds to the vector w and k to the one half at p and v at k bar to the one half at p. There should be subscripts p in both of these. Once they're picked, we define the quantum operator corresponding to the map w, as w hat rp, as just what you get if you apply w to j bar v tensor j of w. That's the complex valued function of connections that we'll interpret as a quantum operator. That step is trivial because in the B model, we can actually assume, well, the B model localizes on flat connections, but since the strip is contractible, a flat connection is a pullback from C. Well, there's a subtlety involving the center of the group. There can be a possible twist by an element of the center. If you're more precise than I've been, the center of the group is trivialized on the two boundaries. And there's a meaningful holonomy, center valued holonomy from the left to the right, which for the dual group is a factor of plus or minus one. Up to sign though, the Wilson operator is just the natural pairing between these two dual spaces applied to the vectors J bar V and J of W. So the eigenvalues of the Wilson operator are like so for all the possible real opers. In other words, <clears throat> since the since C is since the flat connection is pulled back from C, and because of the opair boundary condition, 
The flat bundle is just a real OPER. And these vectors are just vectors in the real OPER bundle at P. And using the SL2 invariant inner product on that vector space, we get the pairing of J bar V with J of W and up to a sign which comes from the center of the group. Those are the possible eigenvalues of this quantum operator. So it's convenient to write the formula as I did in terms of V and W, but it actually only depends on the tensor product V tensor W. And in particular, the dependence on a choice of spin structure disappears at this point because K to the one half tensor K bar to the one half is the bundle of densities in the real sense and doesn't depend on it half entities in the real sense, doesn't depend on a choice of spin structure. So the duality predicts that also on the dual side, the definition of the Tuft operator as an operator requires corners living in the same spaces. That's true as was shown by EF and K using an algebra geometric formula. The duality further predicts that the eigenvalues of the resulting operators are what we found on the G-dual side, namely this, for all the possible real overs. Both signs do occur. That's related on the G side, the A model side, to the fact that minimal hacky modification of an SO3 bundle changes W2 of E. So it exchanges the two components of the moduli space and therefore anti-commutes with an operator that uh, measures W2 of E. And the anti-commutativity forces the operator to have eigenvalues equal and opposite in pairs. So far, I've roughly explained the main points of sections two to five of my paper with Gaiota. I'll skip over section six. It's about an analogous story for real forms, which isn't so well understood. It's interesting, and what is interested is still interesting, but I decided not to try to explain it today. I'll just conclude by saying a few words on section seven to nine. All I really will do is to explain uh, what's the goal of section seven to nine. If you want any details, you have to look at the paper. The twisted A model we've been talking about is a 4D topological field theory, but it's not true that all A brains we've discussed preserve this symmetry. There are lots of topological brains. And in particular, there are topological brains coming from the D3 NS5 and D3 D5 system. But for, to get the BCC brain and the dual OPER brain involves a deformed D3 NS5 and D3 D5 brain. And those are only topological homomorphic. So, okay, Th this picture made sense for topological brains, but we're applying it in the context, in the presence of a chan paton curvature on the D5 brain that breaks part of the topological symmetry. So these brains have all been topological in the sigma direction, but they only are holomorphic in the C direction. Now at a junction between a topological holomorphic boundary condition and a topological one, there's typically a 2D chiral algebra. So here, I've drawn a picture that I actually haven't drawn previously in the lecture, I don't think. So again, there are two dimensions not drawn, the Riemann surface C. I'm only drawing sigma, which throughout my lecture has been a strip. But here we consider a new picture where the strip ends at the bottom, but it ends on a topological brain. So now I have a corner or junction between the topological holomorphic brain, which might have been the BCC brain, and a purely topological brain of which there's a vast proliferation of possibilities. For example, it could be a brain supported on a fiber of the Hitchin vibration just as one example that's actually important in geometric lens, but there are lots of other examples. So one typically finds a 2D chiral algebra at a corner between a topological holomorphic brain and a topological one. What that means is that, remember, see the corner is a point in this picture, but it's really two dimensional. So the statement that you got a chiral algebra means the following. At that corner, there are special operators that only live at the corner and they're holomorphic and um, they're Q invariant. That means they commute with the differential of the A model. And they have OPEs that you would expect of a two-dimensional chiral algebra. 
So literally, there are operators of a 2D counter algebra that live at this corner. I, I'm amazed at the number of misprints in these slides. This should be a theta equals zero. Well, I could start at any theta. So if this brain here is the BCC brain and the gauge theory has a generic angle theta, then the algebra you get at the corner is, a, is the usual Katsumudi chiral algebra of the gauge group G at a level that depends on um, the theta angle. But if the theta angle is zero, then the holomorphic topological and the holomorphic topological brain is BCC. The chiral algebra is the Katsumudi algebra of G at the critical level K equals minus H. That should be theta equals zero. Current algebra at the critical level was a primary tool in the work of Balenton and Drinfeld. Kapustin and I didn't understand how it was related to 4D gauge theory. That was largely explained in a series of papers by Gaiato a few years ago. An early one with Rapchak was this one. I didn't try to give list of all the important papers in that series. So if you do any well-defined path integral with such a corner, you're going to get a conformal block for the chiral algebra that lives at the corner. When I say well-defined path integral, I want it to be closed up somehow. Either it has a well it has a well-defined boundary condition at infinity or at the part of the picture I haven't drawn. Either it's compact or at least there's a well-defined boundary condition at infinity. So that the path integral with insertions at the corner makes sense. If that's the case, the path integral at the corner, the, sorry, the path integral with insertions at the corner will give a set of correlation functions for the operators at the corner that will obey all ward identities of the chiral algebra. So by definition, that will be a conformal block for the chiral algebra that lives at the corner. To make contact with the construction in today's lecture, we want to do it twice. We have a topological holomorphic junction at the left, topological anti-holomorphic boundary condition on the right. At the bottom, we have a topological boundary condition and the two corners give chiral and anti-chiral algebras. It's like in having a modular invariant conformal field theory rather than just a chiral subalgebra. So in this setting, you'll have, in this setting, any insertion of chiral operators here and anti-chiral operators here will produce a vector in the space of physical states. And in fact, this, in this setup with a particular topological boundary condition at the bottom, it's very much like studying a modular invariant conformal field theory that depends on the two manifold C and which we're quantizing on this strip. So I've given you in the last few minutes, kind of a hint of the framework for section seven to nine of our paper. But as I say, if you want to uh, learn more, you should look at the paper. And I think I'll stop here. Thank you. some trouble unmeeting. Are there any questions? I see there's a question from Alok Misra. Go ahead. Uh, hi. Um, I, I just, uh, I wanted to, I had a small confusion. Uh, maybe I, I, I think I, uh, what I understood from an earlier part of today's talk, you mentioned that uh, uh, the, the Higgs bundle moduli space for the gauge group, let's say G on a Riemann surface is like uh, uh, the cotangent bundle of the moduli space of semi-stable holomorphic G bundles over yes. the Riemann surface. But yeah. isn't, it also, isn't it also correct that in your paper with Gaioto, uh, you make a point where you say that actually they are not isomorphic, but in a forthcoming publication, you will tell us how despite that, the Hilbert oh, no. space that you uh, obtain upon quantization could still be mapped to uh, half densities uh, mm -hmm. over the modular space of semi-stable oh. bump. Uh, sorry, I would say that more naively. The two are not isomorphic, but they're the same except for a set of measure zero. And in an L2 theory, a set of measure zero isn't important. Oh, so I see. Um, that point, I wouldn't say much more than that. The main point of the forthcoming paper is to explain why brain quantization of cotangent bundles well, to explain when brain quantization agrees with geometric quantization. 
the case important for our lecture is that brain quantization of cotension bundles agrees with geometric quantization. Okay, all right, thank you. Are there any other questions? I see Ashwin has a question. Oh, yeah, hi. So uh, from the point of view of the moduli of local systems, uh, what is special about opers that uh, only they seem to occur in the setup? Or in other words, is there a similar story with other Lagrangians on the B model side that are somehow related to other local systems? Well, I mean, Kaposin and I were, did not have a good answer to that question. But later, Gayatra and I understood that opers come from the D3, D5 system with a certain Champaton curvature on the D5 frame. So that's special. Uh, another Lagrangian wouldn't have a simple, such a simple realization in terms of brains. But of course, that wasn't the answer of Balancin and Drinfeld. The answer of Balancin and Drinfeld was that they proved that the opers were the spectrum of, in the abstract sense, of one space of one-dimensional representations of Hitchens commuting Hamiltonians. Okay, that was the original answer, but I think a physicist's answer involves the D3, D5 system. Okay. And I see uh, another question from Pandit, I think. Pro yeah. Pro yeah. yeah, first of all, thanks Edward for a wonderful uh, series of lectures. Okay, thank you. So um, I had a couple of questions. Um, the first one is sort of a naive question. When you say HOM, do you mean, uh, so you know, mathematicians often consider HOM between two brains to be a chain complex. Are you taking the zeroth cohomology of that or the direct sum of the Well, um, to me, it really represents the space of physical states in one of these pictures, but the, physics theory has a conserved fermion number charge. And so the space of states before or after taking the cohomology is graded by Q. Right. So it gives the same picture you mentioned. However, in my, I believe in nothing I said was the higher cohomology ever important. So, so that, I, words, I think we're thinking about it. But if it was important, we'd have to consider it. Well, where it was important, <laughs> I said that we wouldn't get positivity for the hum space in the B model uh, unless it's localized at degree zero. That's basically true for the reason you're saying. If the intersections are not isolated, the inner product is going to try, the pairing will try to be between the bottom and the top dimension, which will be graded differently in that grading. So, so but you're taking the sum over all the degrees, right? Is that, did I yes, yes. Right. Um, I see. So, so the reason I was asking is there are some things that would not would depend on the on some choices. Then, so if you when you take home from the coisotropic brain to itself to get the algebra of um, yes. the, the quantized yes. algebra, yes. So that uh, the, there there are two options, right? When I when you can either consider the infinity structure on the sort of um, the minimal model or whatever it's called when you take the cohomology, yes. So in two different models, you would not get quasi-isomorphic answers if, I mean, if I model the category of A brains in one way and somebody else does it differently, then you would get different answers when you pass to just the zeroth cohomology as an algebra. I'm definitely going to give a physicist answer to that kind of question. When I say that the, that the uh, ultra, what we got from having a hypercalorie signal model was that there was an honest quantum signal model that we're studying. So there's a preferred physical model if, it, if it's true that the quantum theory exists. Okay. So there's a definite model I'm talking about, but I might have trouble figuring out what it says in all cases. I see, so in that model, you don't, you can ignore the state, statements, you can ignore all the higher multiplications, the massy products that appear in. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by quantum. Well, I think that it, I talked about cases in which there wasn't any higher cohomology, but oh. if there was, then the massive products would be part of the story. We wouldn't ignore them. I see. Okay. So you would, uh, okay. Again, so you would take the there, I'm merely stating that there would be, I'm merely giving a physicist claim that there's no ambiguity. Uh -huh. 
Um, uh, uh, but actually, I can uh, see. I can qualify that in a way that might make you happier. Uh, let me th try to think carefully before saying anything. Well, actually, the Higgs bundle moduli space isn't a good example of this. But a lot of times, when you have, when there is a hyperkähler metric, complete hyperkähler metric that that extends the structure, the complex symplectic structure we're using, uh, it depends on some additional data, a, a, a symplectic form of type I. For the Higgs bundle moduli space, there's actually no such choice, but often there is. And then when I said that there was a preferred physical model, there really would have been a family of physical models, and it would have been more like the way you're thinking. So I asked this question. It would still, still be a small family of preferred models, but mm -hmm. um, in general, it wouldn't be unique. And yeah. if you're pointing to something where uh, you think it's natural to get a non-unique answer, it might be realized in the setup I'm talking about. I can't yeah. say I know if it is, but it would make sense. Uh -huh. So one of the reasons I was asking this question is also because this argument you gave for the commutativity uh, so yeah. the, the four-dimensional argument, if you were working with chain complexes at all at all times, then the statement that things commute would would really give you something like an E3 algebra, you know, like a little uh, yes cubes algebra or something, which is uh, which is more structured than just being commuted. So I was wondering yeah. if that somehow enters the well. Uh, as a physicist, uh, I don't know what to do with that, but I don't doubt that it's useful and its significance. I didn't have to you were in this story. I was, well, okay. I, I don't personally know what to say about that, but I don't doubt that it would be important for some application. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. I thought it was too technical to go into that anyway, and I wouldn't be the right one to try to do it. Uh, Alec, do you have another question? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, so um, uh, this is, I mean, I think uh, in your paper with Gaido again, uh, you make, uh, you say something to the effect that if you turn off the B in the sigma model, and uh, so you require a CPD symmetry uh, to actually provide an antilinear map to be composed with a non hermitian pairing between the Hilbert space corresponding to a yeah. harm from the Lagrangian brain to the B hat uh, isotropic brain and is dual yes. to obtain a Hermitian pairing. So uh, my, the first part is, could you kindly explain uh, why that is so? And the second part is, uh, uh, how does that become more non-trivial if you turn on the B? Well, uh, well okay. Uh, I wish I could conveniently find the right slide in my lectures, but uh, it would take a while to find it. I'm not sure it's worthwhile. Uh, we want to define, so in general, the A model or B model has a pairing between Han from B1 to B2 and Han from B2 to B1. Instead, what we want is a Hermitian pairing on one, of, on one space rather than a bilinear pairing between one space and a dual space. So we can convert one to the other if we have an, an antilinear map from Han B1 to B2 to its dual space. And CPT, the CPT transformation of the underlying physical theory is an anti-linear map, but it's not a symmetry of the A model or the B model. It maps them to conjugate A models or B models. So we need to combine CPT with an anti-homorphic or anti-symplectic mapping, which compensates for the fact that CPT maps us to the wrong model. So CPT times what I called tau in the lectures gives an anti-linear map from HOM B1, B2 into HOM B2, B1. And that turns the natural A model or B model pairing into a Hermitian pairing on one of the HOM spaces. All right, thank you. Looks like Ashwin has another question. Yeah, so, uh... Uh, on the B model side, uh, maybe you explained this and I missed this. So what exactly corresponds to the choice of a polarization if I'm thinking about the quantization problem? And is it obvious that the Hilbert space is sort of independent of this choice? Uh, 
Well, on the A model side, the, what corresponds to the choice of polarization was the choice of complexification. And then that determines what manifold we're working on on the B model side. But there's no further choice that you make on the B model side. There's no further choice on the A model side either. Instead of picking a polarization as in geometric quantization, we picked a complexification. So the only choice we made was the choice of the space whose signal model we studied. I see. So, and it follows from the A model argument that the Hilbert space that we get is independent of that choice. Independent of what? Independent of the choice of the polarization. Well, no, I didn't make any claim like that. We made a unique choice. Given why a complex manifold, we wanted to use a real symplectic manifold and quantize it. There's a canonical choice of complexification, which was the product of two copies of Y. That was the only uh, choice we studied. We didn't claim we didn't claim anything it was independent of that choice. We just said that there was a canonical choice, so we studied that canonical choice. Okay, thanks. I told you a lot uh, in the first lecture Thursday about cases where there isn't a canonical choice, but today there was one, so we studied it. Uh, Pranav. Yeah, so uh, can I go back to this uh, question uh, we started discussing yesterday about, yes. so in, I think one of your first lectures, you had mentioned that uh, thinking of bungee as a stack is from a physical point of view, working in four dimensions. Yes. Working with the coarse moduli space uh, is somehow, I think working with the 2D, the 2D theory. So I, I didn't really understand why that, you know, what the dictionary is. That, why is the stacky picture four dimensional? Well, I'm only going to give you the same naive answer I've given you before. According to T and Bot, this, the stack bungee can be viewed as the space of all gauge fields on C. So if you do a theory on sigma, who's, if you, a theory on sigma times C is like a theory on sigma whose target space is a space of all fields on C. So tautologically, a theory on sigma whose target is space is the stack is the same thing as a gauge theory in sigma times C. Thanks. So what would the, you know, what would working then in six dimensions, like if you go further up, then what is it? Is there some? Uh, it's more non-classical. So what do we, what we gain from starting in six dimensions is the following. In four dimensions, there's this statement of electric magnetic duality of n equals four Sophia Mills theory, which to physicists is the primary unified statement that's behind everything in geometric line lines and much more besides. But it's a little bit mysterious why it's true. These, there's a six dimensional theory that gives a new interpretation of why it's true. Namely, there's a six dimensional theory with unusual properties that has the following property. The existence and basic facts about the six dimensional theory imply duality in four dimensions. So instead of taking the primary assumption to be electric magnetic duality in four dimensions, one could take the primary statement to be the existence of a certain six dimensional theory with some simple statements about what happens to it on a circle times a five manifold. Uh, I mean, it's a matter of perspective whether that interpretation of duality. Four dimensions is enough for a complete general statement of geometric line lens duality. But in some ways, physicists think that starting in six dimensions gives a better explanation. This part doesn't have a, ma a mathematical uh, interpretation yet fully, I guess. Is that what? Well, does, uh, well, the six dimensional theory doesn't have a definition that's easy for mathematicians to understand. Mm -hmm. Not that the four dimensional one does either. Um, N equals four superior Mills theory is a structure that physicists have confidence in, mm -hmm. but its existence is not a mathematical theorem, definitely not, let alone the electric and magnetic duality. Um, but <clears throat> at least um, there's a semi-classical explanation of what it means as gauge theory in four dimensions. The six dimensional theory is more mysterious. 
it's trying to be a non-Abelian gerb theory, but non-Abelian gerbs, let's say with simple structure groups, don't exist classically. Somehow it's a quantum version of that. Um, the most concrete explanation of what it is actually, or at least for some purposes, <laughs> is M theory on a seven manifold that's asymptotic to anti sitter space times S4. Uh, uh, well, you'd find if you, okay, let's say, I think maybe I should just say yes when you asked if it was hard for mathematicians to come to grips with the six dimensional theory. Thanks, that was very really helpful. Okay, sure. Are there any other questions? All right, it seems like not. So let's thank the speaker again for this talk and for the whole series. Thank you.